So tonight is uh, Mormon chapter one. It's basically picking up where it left off at the end of fourth Nephi. At the end of fourth Nephi, the, the, the Nephites had uh, become wicked, right, as the Lamanites were, so that there was no longer anybody who was who were worthy to even hang on to the, the records, and that the, they were afraid they were going to be destroyed, so that uh, God instructed a man named uh, Amaron, who I guess was the last record keeper, to, to hide them somewhere until such a time that somebody would be ready to pick them up. Okay, so that's, that's where we left off, you know, the fourth Nephi, so now as we begin Mormon, it's still that same, that same time frame. Right? We're going to see Amaron at the beginning of this and see who he turns it over to, okay? And now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about ten years of age, and I began to be learned somewhat, after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child, and art quick to observe. Therefore, when ye are about twenty and four years old, I would that ye should remember the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And when ye are of that age, go to the land Antum, unto a hill which shall be called Shim, and there have I deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. And behold, ye shall take the plates of Nephi unto yourself, and the remainder shall ye leave in the place where they are, and ye shall engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. As you look at the first verse there, it says that now we've seen several times where... Um, a verse might start out, I Mormon something, all right, and he's followed by that. And that's mainly because he's he's the record keeper, all right, or he's the abridger of, of the records. He's the one that put it all together and made this book, known as the, the Book of Mormon, right? But now Mormon is himself, a, I'll call him a, a character in the story, all right, where he's, uh, now it's reached a point in time where, where he actually lived, so now he's telling his own story within the, within the big story, Right, so now it's reached his time frame, which is, uh, according to him, about around 320 A.D., right? that this is when Mormon uh, is living. So now he's going to tell his own story, as it says in the first verse, he says, now I, Mormon, make a record of things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. See? So, so he's, or he's abridged all the rest of, of, of the writing and the, has all different names, but now this is my part of the story, and I'm calling it, after my name, the, the Book of, of Mormon, right? which makes, makes sense. Pretty much every book in, in the Book of Mormon is named the same way, the, the book of somebody, right? whoever the, the writer was. Right? Like we have the book of Alma, the book of Mosiah, the book of Omni, the book of Jacob, and so forth. The, the, the only one that would appear to be different, but it's not really different, is the, the ones that are written by, by Nephi. Right? But uh, the only reason it looks a little different is because there was multiple Nephi's doing it, so therefore they, they called it 1st Nephi, 2nd Nephi, 3rd Nephi, 4th Nephi. But all right, so this is Mormon, Mormon both the abridger and now Mormon the writer, and, and Mormon uh, who's in part of the story. And uh, now it says in, in verse 2, it says that by the time that Amron hit up the records, which we read about at the end of 4th Nephi, uh, he came to Mormon, he's only 10 years old, all right, at that, the point that the, the story is being told. So when Amron came to him, he's a 10-year-old boy, and said, listen, you know, and it's, you know, could only be through the Spirit of the Lord that he would discern this, because I mean, I don't know that I would tell a, a 10 year old boy, you know, basically, I'm going to use you for an important thing, just, just wait, wait till you're grown up. But that's what he did. He said, you know, when you're about 24 years old, then I, uh, I'm going to tell you where the records were hidden, I want you to go and get them. All right, so we're going to keep them hidden for the next 14 years and just give you time to grow up, and then when you grow up, you, you go get them and you'll be the new, the new record keeper. All right, so it would be through the Spirit of the Lord that you would determine that, because I don't know that, that you would be willing to just take a guess or a gamble on a 10 year old and say he's going to turn into the kind of man that we would want to entrust this to, right? But he did, right? He said, I, uh, this is Mormon who was 10 years old, he began to be learned somewhat, as a matter of fact, so I guess he was a smart, a smart kid, and, and Amaron said that I perceive that you're a sober child, quick to observe, so therefore when you're 24, I want you to remember where this is hidden and then come and, come and get them, right? Because in the, in the reference in here, he says the go to the land Antum and a hill that will be called Shim, and that's where I deposited the, the sacred engravings for these people, all right? So take the plates, and then and then you and then you'll be responsible, and you'll have the records, which obviously we know he did because he had the whole thing to turn into the the, the, the Book of Mormon. Okay, so this is how he got the job. That from when he was ten years old, uh, Amaron gave him the, the job and said, "Okay, you're you're going to be the one that takes it up 
It's just wait till you're grown up and then go get the, the records and continue with the record keeping. Remembering that the, uh, there's a shortage of people who are really trustworthy right now as far as keeping the records, so there's nobody else Amaron to turn it over to. So that's why he picked this 10 year old boy and figured, well, we'll wait a few years, keep him hidden, and then, then he can pick it up from there. And I, Mormon, being a descendant of Nephi, and my father's name was Mormon, I remembered the things which Amaron commanded me. And it came to pass that I, being eleven years old, was carried by my father into the land southward, even to the land of Zarahemla. The whole face of the land had become covered with buildings, and the people were as numerous almost as it were the sand of the sea. Since he's a descendant of, of Nephi, so therefore he would be a, a Nephite. Okay, and you can see that his a little bit of biographical information here. He says his father's name is Mormon, so this is Mormon Jr. Right, and that's, that's his father, and now he's just recalling just a few things from as he's growing up when he was 11 years old, as it says there. That uh, he says, I, I went and saw the land of Zarahemla, which was now because uh, it's covered with buildings, very populated, it was a big, a big city. Right, and you, you may remember um, actually, it was during Fort Nephi reading that uh, you know, we it talked about different cities being rebuilt, right, and repopulated because a lot of them were destroyed. A lot of them, at the time of the, the crucifixion of, of Christ, the, a lot of destructions, the city of Zarahemla was destroyed, but then it was rebuilt during the, the fourth Nephi time, and so now as, as Mormon has this memory of, yeah, well, it's, it's Zarahemla, all, all buildings, all people, right? It was a big, uh, big populated city, right? So they, these are things that he remembers as he was, was growing up. And it came to pass in this year, there began to be a war between the Nephites, who consisted of the Nephites and the Jacobites and the Josephites and the Zoramites. And this war was between the Nephites and the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites. Now the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites were called Lamanites, and the two parties were Nephites and Lamanites. And it came to pass that the war began to be among them in the borders of Zarahemla by the waters of Sidon. He's going to be now be telling about a war that occurred. Okay, and he's giving these, these different names of the groups that were uh, going to be on the different sides of, for the war, right? And, and really, all these names are um, just reflect who the ancestor was. Okay, so it's the same as we've had Nephites and Lamanites all along. But they were from Nephi and Laman, right? So really, it continues to be the Nephites versus the Lamanites, but they're showing even a, a further breakdown within that. So, like the, in verse eight, it says the war was between the, the Nephites, who consisted of the Nephites, the Jacobites, the Josephites, and the Zoramites, right? So, therefore, it would be descendants of Nephi, Jacob, Joseph, and Zoram, right? Which, if you remember, way, way, way back at the beginning of the story, right? They were the ones on the good side, right? That they were the, the, the brothers, uh, and Nephi and Jacob were the, the, and Joseph were the good brothers, all right? And then the Zoram was the, the friend who, who came went along with them, all right? So, these were all their descendants now together on one side, known as, known as the, the Nephites for, for simplicity's sake, right? And then the, the, the Lamanites consisted of Lamanites, Lemuelites, and Ishmaelites, all right? So therefore, the, the descendants of Laman and Lemuel and Ishmael, right? Where, where Ishmael was the, uh, the, the father of the other family, the, the one who came in. So, so some of their uh, children stayed on the Laman and Lemuel side, right? So therefore, that's why it's Lamanites, Lemuelites, and Ishmaelites make up the, the Lamanites, right? So that's a, it's just saying, well, basically, who's on what team, right? Who's on what side here? And so, as you can see, in, so it says in 9, the Lamanites, Lemuelites, and Ishmaelites were called Lamanites, and therefore, the two parties were the Nephites and the Lamanites, right? So it was just a way of showing you who went with which side, right? But really, it's going to be referred to as Nephites and Lamanites, just for simplicity's sake. This way, we don't have to read a lot of long names like we just did, right? But rather, we would just keep it simple, Nephites and Lamanites, right? And so, now having talked about who the two sides are, now it says in 10 that the war began to be among them in the border of Zarahemla. So that in, in that big city of Zarahemla was where this the, where the battle began. Then, where this, so that those are the people who were involved, but it was still going to be called the Nephites versus the Lamanites, just like it's been all along. And it came to pass that the Nephites had gathered together a great number of men, even to exceed the number of 30,000. And it came to pass that they did have in this same year a number of battles in which the Nephites did beat the Lamanites and did slay many of them. And it came to pass that the Lamanites withdrew their design and there was peace settled in the land and peace had remained for the space of about four years that there was no bloodshed. 
but wickedness did prevail upon the face of the whole land, insomuch that the Lord did take away his beloved disciples, and the work of miracles and of healing did cease because of the iniquity of the people. All right, so in this first uh, battle that it describes, right, as you can see in 11, it says that uh, what it says, the uh, Nephites had a great number of men, uh, 30,000, so therefore they, they were victorious in this particular battle, right? And therefore the Lamanites withdrew in, in verse 12. It says there was no fighting for another four years, all right? So you can actually start to count it up now. It's more it was 11, so now it's going to roll forward him being 15, all right? And, uh, but now in 13, it, it mentions that it was wickedness to prevail upon the face of the whole land, all right? Because there's just no, nobody righteous, as we've been saying. So in so much that the Lord took away his beloved disciples and the work of miracles and healing deceased. So they, when it refers to the beloved disciples, it's talking about the three Nephites. I can just remember they've been around the whole, the whole time. So I mean, they've been around for almost 300 years now. Right? And in fact, you may even remember uh, Mormon when he was writing the story of the three Nephites that he interjected, hey, you know what, I, I still see him now. You know, I still see him around now. And so this, he was writing it about this time, right? So, so that... Uh, he's, right, so he's aware of them, but, but it says now that the Lord kind of removed them because there was nothing they could do at this particular time. Nobody wanted to know about Christ. Nobody wanted to come to Christ. And that's what they were uh, staying around for, was to bring souls to Christ. So that they were not really commissioned to do that right now because nobody was interested. It was all, all wickedness. And so as a result, says, miracles and healings has cease because of the iniquity of the people. So, so where people have no faith and no righteousness, I mean, that God is not going to work in that kind of an environment. And there were no gifts from the Lord, and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any, because of their wickedness and unbelief. And I, being fifteen years of age, and being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord, and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. And I did endeavor to preach unto this people, but my mouth was shut, and I was forbidden that I should preach unto them, for behold, they had willfully rebelled against their God, and the beloved disciples were taken away out of the land because of their iniquity." Right, so now in verse 14 it says, there were no gifts and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any. As we understand, you know, it's after you're baptized that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. So nobody was being baptized because everybody was, was wicked. So therefore, the Holy Ghost was not being given to anybody. And so you know, saying the Holy Ghost is not there, you have lots of wickedness and unbelief. Right? And so there was also no, no gifts from the Lord, obviously, because nobody believed in that. So now, as we already mentioned, Mormon is now 15 years of age, as it's mentioning in the 15th verse, and so it says he, he himself was visited of the Lord, so that uh, he had his own experience, and so as you can see, the beginning of at least one righteous person at this point, right, because he's interacting with the Lord, and uh, so that's why he says, I tasted anew of the goodness of Jesus, so he recognized who Christ was, and maybe this was his conversion at this moment, you know, it doesn't really say, but he was he's visited of the Lord at that point, all right, and, and so, whereas at 16 now, it says he endeavor to, to preach to the people, he tried to preach to the people what, you know, what, what they should be doing, but notice it's even more that, more than the people not listening, he says that, that God actually made them stop, right, and so almost like the, you know, why they cast your, your pearls before the swine kind of thing, I guess, it's just people are so not open to it, that it's not even worth uh, his, his time to do that, as you can see, he says, I, I was forbidden that I should preach unto them because they have willfully rebelled against, against God. So much so that the disciples take it out of the land and so forth, right? So you can see it's a very evil time. I mean, I've not heard of any other time like this, all right, where it wasn't even, don't even bother to preach the gospel, all right? These people are so out there, are so wicked and, and, and so evil, and so we're not open to it. So we're not going to have to preach to them. Just let them, just let them go, and let, let, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But I did remain among them, but I was forbidden to preach unto them because of the hardness of their hearts. And because of the hardness of their hearts, the land was cursed for their sake. And these Gadianton robbers who were among the Lamanites did infest the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth, and they became slippery, because the Lord had cursed the land, that they could not hold them, nor retain them again. And it came to pass that there were sorceries, and witchcrafts, and magics, and the power of the evil one was wrought upon all the face of the land, even unto the fulfilling of all the words of Abinadi, and also Samuel the Lamanite. We're describing a, uh, a wicked time, as you can tell. All right? so, so again, 17 repeats, it's like, I was forbidden to preach unto them through the hardness of their hearts. All right? and, and now in, in 18, it refers to um, a condition that says where the, the Lord curses the, the land because of the, uh, the evil people, 
It says, and, and their treasures became slippery. It says that they began to hide up their treasures in the earth, and then, but it says they became slippery because the Lord cursed the land. So yeah, I, I would gather that, that means that they hid them, maybe buried them in the ground, and then when they went back to look for them, they couldn't find them, right? They, you know, they couldn't either couldn't remember where they, they dug or where they dug there, and now that it wasn't there anymore. And so you think it's only being slippery. It's like you, know, you can't hold on to it. It seems like you should be able to hold on to it. You can't. But picture hold a piece of soap or something, but it's wet. You know, you just can't hold to hold on to it. And that's the condition they're in. So here, people who are going to put their their hope and their faith and their trust and their riches and their treasures and says are unable to do so, right? They're finding it even difficult to hold on to because they think they can put it in the, even in their own ground and it's going to be there and now it's not there. So this is, you know, the, the Lord cursed them in that, in that way and cursed the land and they couldn't even hide their treasures in it because they, they couldn't find it. It became slippery as it's called. And so in 19, just again, further describing the conditions of the sorceries, witchcraft, magic, and, and so forth, the power of evil. Right, and, and actually, it, it references the words of Abinadi and Samuel the Lamanite, and, uh, and they had uh, foretold this time, right? In fact, at least one of them talked about a time when uh, treasures would be, be slippery and so forth, so they did uh, forecast that this would happen. So that's why Mormon is writing the, the whole story, because he knows what Abinadi and Samuel the Lamanite said, because he's already written it up. So he's just mentioning here, you know, that, uh, in the prophecies of Abinadi and Samuel the Lamanite, they mentioned this time, that's what happened.